Two points dropped or one point gained? That is the question. As a Chelsea fan, it's very strange this morning, isn't it? Waking up, not really knowing how to feel after yesterday's performance. But I do genuinely think, despite the late heartbreak in yesterday's match, there's a lot of positivities to take. And here to help me break down those positivities is my good friend and channel fan favourite, Josh Aveste. Josh... What's happening, mate? Mate, it's good. It's really good to be back with you. Uh, look, I'm I'm taking some positives after yesterday. Mm. So, like, let's get into it. Let's talk about how the performances, what went wrong, what went right. Let's let's get right into it. Before we get into it, I want you lot to do me a massive favour. Show your appreciation for Josh coming by this morning. Click the link in the description to this video, which will take you over to Josh's channel. Please subscribe. He is dropping Chelsea-based content all the time off there. So click the link, hit subscribe to his channel. If you are new around here and you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you do that and hit the bell so that you get a notification every time one of my videos goes live. Let's start off by having a look at the official lineup that Sky Sports put out for the match where obviously you can see we went in the 4-2-3-1 formation however when I was watching the match it looked a little bit more like the lineup that you can see on screen now with Cole Palmer and Conor Gallagher probably being our two most advanced players and obviously we look at the match Josh the main talking point started with the previously mentioned Cole Palmer converting from the penalty spot in the 15th minute but the main question I want to ask you is was it a penalty or not? Yeah, look, it was an obvious penalty, wasn't it? The guy's in a, uh, the guy's arms in a very unnatural position. He stops the ball from going towards the goal. Now, whether that ball was going in the goal is actually kind of irrelevant, isn't it? He stops the ball from getting in an area where it could potentially be a goal. So it's as simple as that. Like, I don't think we need to like um, overthink this. And look, a lot of Arsenal fans will be talking about it and be questioning the decisions. But let's be honest, the referee hasn't had a stinker there at all. He's had a good look at it because obviously it was a VAR decision. And so he's had all the time in the world to make his call and he's and he's judged it. So look, Mate, I don't if think there's anything silver wrong. in the exact same position yeah. and it doesn't get given for Arsenal, they're yeah. going mental. Exactly, exactly. And also I would have been surprised if it was a Chelsea player and it wasn't given. Like I, I felt either way, whatever player that was, if that was a Liverpool player, a Man United player, I feel that that's a that's a penalty. So look, I don't think anyone can argue about that one. And uh, then would you have moaned if it was given if it was Chelsea player? I don't. I don't know if I would. Like I, I think I would maybe on the kickoff. Now in answer the moment. honestly. <laughs> I think in the kickoff in the moment you go for fuck's sake, not yeah. another one. But then also like in the cold light of day you go, okay, come on, it has stopped like a goal scoring opportunity, which is the key thing. Do you know where I've got sympathy for them here? Obviously the rules are chopping and changing season in season out, aren't they? And it used to be if it was intentional. So I can look at that last night and go. No, no way is that intentional. You know, you've, your arms have got to be somewhere. You're jumping for the ball. Often to get leverage when you're jumping, you know, you're going to, if you do any sort of jumping, remember at school you did a long jump, something like that. To get that leverage, you're going to lift your arms. But obviously the rules as they stand don't actually cover whether it's intentional. It's not about whether it's intentional. It's about whether a non-ball playing part of your body uh, makes contact with the ball and it affects the game. And you can't say that that wouldn't have affected the game. I, I don't think Mudrick's header was going in or anything like that, but it did train, change the course of the ball, where it was going. And for that reason, it's a penalty all day long, isn't it? So yeah. the other interesting point with this penalty, though, we saw a little bit of an on-pitch argument, didn't we, between Sterling and Palmer. Can we agree, before, before we sort of go <laughs> into that, there's only one man that us Chelsea fans wanted to see take that penalty, surely? <sighs> yeah, I can understand your point of view. I can understand why Sterling wanted it though. And I have to say, I hated that in the moment when, because we obviously saw it in a replay afterwards, didn't mm. we? I think when we, when we were watching the coverage of it. And I hated the fact that they were arguing because quite frankly, Cole Palmer, young kid, and he's having Sterling, his elder, the guy that sort of like even mentored him when he was at City, you know, and he's going, I want to take that ball off you. I hated that. And that's one of the things where you go, if he then goes and misses the penalty, you go, for fuck's sake, Sterling, you really got in his head and you caught, you could have caused that, you know, had a big part to play. So like, I, I hated that moment, but what I loved is obviously he gets the ball, he puts, he slots it, and then afterwards there's a bit of a moment where they do sort of kiss and make up, yeah. and at least you've got that sort of team spirit afterwards. But I have to say, like I think Potch has got to get 
both those players in and he's got to say, right, Cole, you are my penalty taker. And look, we're never arguing on the pitch ever again. Because that's, that's, that should Did you happen. also see Enzo's reaction during? No, I didn't. What did Enzo do? So during the little argument, Enzo comes over and you can't hear what you're saying, but he literally looks at Sterling and points at Cole Palmer straight away. Yeah. As if to basically say, mate, he he's taking it. And I think, as I say, like, as a Chelsea fan sitting and watching, it's got to be Cole Palmer taking that penalty. Like, it's got to be Cole Palmer. I don't, look, you could probably pull up Sterling's record and it would probably prove me wrong here. And I'm not saying Sterling misses a lot of penalties or anything like that, but Sterling isn't the player that I associate with that sort of cool, calm, clinicalness in yeah, front of I goal. Agree. Like, you know, you know, Sterling's best goals are usually when he doesn't really have time to think. And we all know one thing, especially with sort of the sportsmanship that comes around it, you've got a lot of time to think when it comes to the penalty spot. So I just think that Cole Palmer is the obvious option there, don't you? Mm, I do. I have to say, I'm a bit worried like long-term about our penalty taking situation. Like, I don't know if we've got one outstanding option. I don't know if Cole Palmer, yes, um, proven that he's an outstanding penalty taker. He's slotted two that he's got fair play to him. Like, that's what you can say. And I understand why you're backing him. But I also like... I don't know. I would like Reese on, on them sometimes. Like, uh, I don't think we have a recognised out and out number one penalty taker. And that's why on the pitch, there was that argument. And yeah. so I think Poch has basically got to say to them, he's got to go in training, see who's the best and go, if it is Cole Palmer, there's no, you know, question about it. He's the number one penalty taker. Even if Reese and people like that are on the pitch, you just got to say he's the guy. So I think we need to resolve that pretty quickly because otherwise I could see that being an issue. And, if you're missing penalties for us with the amount of chances that we miss, that's a that's a big worry. Half time, obviously we go in one nil up, we come back out, and I'm sort of looking at things and I'm thinking, right, Arteta would have had a real strong word with his boys here. They'll come out, bang up for it. But again, the trend just carried on in our favour, pretty dominant. And then Mikhailo Mudrik channels his inner Ronaldinho. Completely intentional, wasn't it? Yeah, it was completely intentional. We were laughing about it on the kickoff, weren't we? Because I don't give a fuck if it's intentional or not, right? I'm going to claim till the cows come home that he meant to do it. And look, I think if you watch him, he was w looking for the cross. If you watch his eyes when he was about to do it, he was looking for players in the box, right? He didn't look towards the goal. But look, I don't give a fuck. If I'm Pochettino, if I'm Conor Gallagher, anyone speaking after the game, I'm going, yeah, Mikhailo's come back in the change room. He said he completely meant that. Mm. He's got he's got it. He's got his wonder goal. Because quite frankly, he needs that confidence boost. Now, look, he's got two goals in two games in the last two. Like, he, he needs that to then go and push on. And I feel like he is a player that needs that confidence to be able to get the best out of him. And so uh, I was chuffed that he got it in. And whether he meant it or not, I don't I don't really care. Mm. I think definitely a good opportunity now for Mudrick to push on from here, as you say, two goals, two matches. He's looked really sharp, hasn't he? Um, and he's almost now in a position where I think more often than not, Pochettino's going to have him starting. It's interesting to see how it goes there with that sort of front line of Sterling, Palmer, Mudrick, because, you know, let's not forget, we've got Nkunku to come back. We've got other players that are going to be in and around that sort of uh, starting eleven. So it's very interesting. It's, it's healthy in a way, isn't it? Because it breeds for really good competition. And what I was looking at, you know, towards the start of the season, we were looking at it and we were thinking, OK, Sterling's the stand out there, putting in performances week in, week out. But now when you add Palmer into the mix, who's been phenomenal since getting his sort of opportunity to break into the first team, Mudrick, who is slowly but surely coming good, we've got such an exciting sort of front line there to pick from, haven't we? Yeah, the depth that we've got just throughout the team now, when the players do come back, like I always worried that we had a really, really young squad and like how um, competitive would it actually be? Like, would it end up just being Jackson and Kunku, you know, Sterling, the the sort of, I don't know, obviously Jackson isn't experienced, but the, the sort of like lead players just making a difference and playing more often than not. But now you look at the squad and I, I even looked at it when we talked later on about um, Brentford and the preview that we're going to do with that. Like, how are we we going to fit all of these boys in the team with the players that we have now, let alone all the injuries. So I, I'm actually, in a weird way, I'm actually a bit concerned about how we fit them all in because all of them are actually having moments where they look very, very good. Like, I don't think you can very obviously drop Sterling at the moment after his performance mm -hmm. against Burnley. I don't think you can drop Cole Palmer at all because of the way he's playing. But then how are you going to get Broya or, Mud uh, or Jackson in the team when Mudrick is also playing very well? Mm -hmm. So like, I'm actually like, it's a good problem to have. 
right? Yeah. But I am also a bit worried where it's like, how are we going to make, because you want a sort of steady starting 11, don't you? How are we going to sort of build like relationships and consistency when all of these players are playing well and they all deserve to be starting? I actually think it's a bit um, concerning, but we'll uh, let, let's get to that bridge when it comes to it. You know, I'd rather have that problem. So back to the match, obviously, yeah. uh, Sanchez gives away the ball. A few people were saying that maybe Enzo should have had a little bit of blame there. Others were saying it wasn't Enzo's fault. It was a really bad pass. Sanchez gives it away. Declan Rice slots it home beautifully. It's an open goal, but I'll tell you what, you still got to finish him under pressure. He puts that in the bottom corner, and then obviously a couple of minutes later, 84th minute, <clears throat> Saka, who I'm going to be honest, was kept really quiet all game by Kukurea, whips the ball in, and Trossard's there, the super sub to find it at the back post as he always seems to when he comes off the bench. So, obviously, there is that feeling, isn't there, of two points lost. You know, we had it in our hands. If we were 1-0 up in the 84th minute and then we concede, it would have been gutting. But when you're 2-0 up and it ends up going back to 2-2, it's almost sickening. So we're going to get into, obviously, the Sanchez mistake. We're going to get into all the individual players' performances. But the question asked at the start of the video, is it two points dropped or one point gained? I think if you say to me... I always look at this in two ways, right? Before the match, I would have ripped your hand off for a draw. I would have completely taken that e easily. And actually, I don't know about you, mate, but before the game, I was really, really nervous. Obviously, look, it's a London derby. You're always going to be nervous. I, I remember all of these um, Arsenal games. I always felt incredibly apprehensive with the way that it was going to go because they're all, they've always been a good team. Even in the era where we were beating them every every time we were playing them, they always had the potential to sort of come to Stamford Bridge and mix it up. You're always worried about it. And I actually thought before the game, I had a bit of a moment where it was like my heart was saying, oh, I think we could get something here. My head was saying, I think it could be three or four nil loss mm. like, I think we could have easily capitulated if they'd got an early goal in the same time that we did it could have easily been a loss mate when we saw that front line as well yeah like we were hoping that they were going to be injury hit a little bit and then the team sheet comes out and you see a front line Jesus through the middle and you've got Martinelli and Saka either side of him now we all know that's the Arsenal front line and you can pick it with your eyes closed but we were obviously hoping the injuries were going to hamper them a little bit we were probably hoping to see Kai Havertz start in that nine because although the Arsenal fans are sort of warming to Havertz in a nine that sort of warmth will have ice poured on it very very soon when they see him in that nine week in week out so we were hoping that there would be a sort of injury hit lineup and when we saw that knowing the sort of um, instability we had in our back line in terms of Levi Colwell is a brilliant centre-back but he hasn't played at centre-back for a lot of the season De Sassi's out after proving his worth in the last couple of games Merlo Gusto coming right back in after that three much ban to a very hard game and Kukurea a player that we're definitely going to touch on back over in the left back position where we had always thought he was very much underwhelming last season so to see that front line and then to have the context of how we did against it I think he's saying that our players have got to take a massive massive pat on the back for isn't it yeah look if that game was at the end of last season it, it, you know even with the same team sheet you know just just based on the momentum or even at the start of this year and look I know we had a good result against Liverpool but I've, I think Arsenal are a completely different side mm. than Liverpool like even quality wise I do I do honestly feel that so like even if it would have been in those time periods we would have lost that game 3-0 e mm. easily so to come out of it with a score draw where we've dominated the game for 75 minutes and yes we've then capitulated and let two goals in I actually think in the grand scheme of things, is a, is a very, very good result. And I've seen a lot of people after the game come out and feel say it's like a loss. Mm. And I don't necessarily look at it in that way. I look at it in the way of, look, we're building something here. We've got two very good results against the, the hardest teams we've played, Liverpool and Arsenal. We've got draws against them. We haven't been beaten. We've lost against easier teams. So like when it actually comes down to it against the big six, we're playing okay as we expect. And we know our team's going to get better. So look, I, I actually think and other people haven't been very positive. I'm actually very bullish and positive about this game. I think this is a a, a launching board for now what we're going to end up doing because these young players are only going to get better. Yeah, after that game, I'm looking at it and I was already sort of starting to think this, but we can go and beat anyone. I include Man City in that. I include every team we got in this hard run of fixtures. Am I saying we're going to get wins against all of them? No. Newcastle away is going to be a really, really tough match. Spurs away on the Monday night coming up soon is going to be a really, really tough match. But all of these games in individual matches Matches, I very much believe that we can win. Now, yesterday, see, we compare it to the Liverpool match, right? We got battered in the first 20 minutes by Liverpool, right? And then we came into the match and we became pretty, uh, I, I don't know if dominance too strong a word, but if it's too strong a word for the Liverpool match, it's almost a weak word for yesterday because we were dominant. We were 
dominant against them yesterday. We completely overran them in midfield. And I just thought that tactically, and we've had a little bit of back and forth on this, I thought that it was a Pochettino masterclass yesterday. Yeah. Do you go along with that or not? I, I think it was a masterclass up until the <laughs> point of the subs. And then I'm not saying it's a disaster class after that. I'm just saying like with the benefit of hindsight, I'm not sure the subs were exactly what we needed there. Like, for example, you take off Mudrick, who was playing very well, and you brought on Jackson. You thought at the time, that makes sense. We need a focal point up front. But again, Jackson wasn't really at the races. And again, he's been injured. So how much has he been training? We knew he was a doubt. And so that one, you're sort of questioning. And then again, like you're, you're bringing off other players. They're like the Reese James one. Like the Cole Palmer one as well, like bringing him off when he was playing so well. Maybe he was gassed. And actually, um, Conor Gallagher said after the game that he was absolutely gassed. He said his legs were hurting. He said a lot of the players were finished. And I understand that because they're playing one of the most elite teams in the Premier League right now. Let's so, remember with Cole Palmer, though, he was somewhat of a doubt yep, for yep. the match. I, I wouldn't say he was a doubt. He was somewhat of a doubt. There was obviously the thing about him having a real bad dead leg on international duty. I think he might have even came home early he from did, that. Did, yeah. But then, you know, we were reassured because we had seen him training throughout the week um and then obviously look the nicholas jackson one having him on he didn't do anything like what i thought he could have done because i thought nicholas jackson could have been a real handful listen he wasn't given a massive opportunity to show what he could do but i thought he could be a real handful with taking mudrick off i do sort of agree with you there because i look at it and i think sometimes the best form of defense is attack now i'm not saying we need to go and attack arsenal because i think that our best opportunities would have been off the counter attack as they press forward and the game went on however you know, having someone like a Mudrick there is going to have have a defender who's obviously either marking him or closest to him, have them really sort of vigilant to make sure he doesn't get in behind because they know with the pace he's got, it's blistering and he can get in behind. And that may then stifle their attack a little bit because they know they have to keep one eye on Mudrick. So I think just his presence on the pitch would have helped us out ever so slightly. Yeah. But I, I think like... With both of the substitutes made, you can give real good reason for it. Everything's in hindsight. You only look at it after. And ultimately, the things that cost us the match, right? The, the sort of two mistakes that cost us the match. Because even the second goal, I'm not calling it a mistake because it sounds harsh. But of course, Melo Gusto could have done better in that situation. Then you could flip it, maybe, and say, well, Reese James should have been there. I completely understand that. But I do think that the two mistakes we made had nothing to do with tactics. They really didn't. Not in my opinion. You, you could argue, and I mean, we'll get into the goals in more detail in a second, but you could argue that Poch is telling Sanchez to play out from the back. So you could argue that that is a tactical decision. Mm. Um, and the, the second one, you could argue that it's two mistakes. It's Kukurela not shutting down Saka in the way that he needed to and Gusto switching off. And then you could also argue that maybe Reese should have been further back. So like when we're talking about Poch... I am by no means saying that any of this is to do with him. And in fact, when we're talking about the team set up now, right? I thought Poch set up his team in a in an imaginably smart way. And the reason why I say that is because even now, you and I don't know what the formation was of the of mm. the players yesterday. Do we do you agree with that? I thought it was like a 4-4-2 with yeah. the two players obviously uh being pushed furthest forward in terms of Gallagher and Cole Palmer. But then you've showed me a heat map and actually that doesn't reflect that. You know, that more looks like it was Sterling was our most advanced player. So it, it, it is strange when we're watching it. And we had this debate back and forth, didn't we, right? After the first few games of the season, which you were at multiple games, I was at multiple games, and it was like three games in and we were still going, yeah, but are we playing a three or are we playing a four at the back? And we was having this debate week in, week out. And at the time, because we weren't winning, it was a little bit like, oh, for fuck's sake. Whereas now I'm starting to love it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, no one knows. It's a complete crazy formation and no one knows what's going on. But I think that what we're seeing here is so much tactical adaptability from Pochettino. And obviously the... The thing we were sort of told about Pochettino when coming into the job is very stubborn, doesn't budge on his tactics. And that is not what I'm seeing from him so far. Like, even you look at the possession stats yesterday, right? We have very notably um, dipped when it comes to the amount of possession we're having in these matches. But on the eye test and what we're seeing on the pitch is benefiting us massively. It's giving us more uh, spaces to play the ball into and more creativity and allowing teams to come to us a little bit so that we can catch them. And I'm not saying just on the counter, but it's another thing that we've brought into our game. And if that's not sort of adapting to the squad you've got with Pochettino, I don't know what is. 
Yeah. I feel the way that he's building it at the moment is he's building like a fluid system, as you say, where you don't know where particular players are on the pitch in terms of like a traditional formation. And that's the way that modern football is going to go. And actually, like, if you look at what we were trying to build with Potter, Potter was trying to build that. He was trying to say, I want players to play roles and they don't, the formation is irrelevant, actually. Like, I, I want them to do certain things when they're pressing and certain things when they're attacking, certain things when they're defending, certain things when it's on transition. Like, the, like he's briefing every single one of those players to do different things, mm. right? And that was, that was Potter. So you're saying Potter weaker. deserves the credit, not yeah, Pochettino. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, exactly that, mate. Exactly <laughs> that. So that, but that was Potter. And then we're going with Pochettino, who is a by far a superior ma manager. And he's going a level beyond that, where he's then going, Conor Gallagher, when you're pressing a player, I want you to be the furthest advanced because you're the best at that. Cole Palmer, when you were there, when Connor's pressing, you are, are alongside him, but also you're dropping in to fill in in the hole. So like they've they've got instructions at that granular level, and that's what I love about the way that Poch is setting up now. And I actually think that that's going to serve us incredibly well. And we're tactically, if you look at our tactical setup compared to other teams, we are further advanced than a lot of the other teams there. And that's why we're getting the beneficial stats in terms of the XG and that sort of thing. Like we, that's why we seem to be winning the XG battle. We spoke about XG there, right? And yeah. and obviously, uh, a multiple amount of times, we've obviously spoke about the fact that the numbers are sort of telling us that things are going to come good for us and we're going to have an uplift in form, which obviously now we're seeing massively. But regardless of the numbers, right, when you look at the style of play now, when you look at the way we play, mate, some of the football we played yesterday was absolutely beautiful. Like yep. one touch passing, splitting through the lines, completely stifled Arsenal in midfield. They had nothing for us there. And when we were talking about midfield freeze at the start of the season, one of the ones we were looking at in Arsenal, we were thinking that's right up there. We now, in my opinion, this is crazy, right? One of the first times me and you ever got in the studio together, we spoke about midfield freeze and we were rating and we were going... Oh, well, out of the top seven, maybe Chelsea's is probably right down there. Mate, we got one of the best, if not the best, midfield three in the league now. It is ridiculous how good we're looking there. But what, I, what I'm sort of going off subject on, what I want to say here is, if you look at the table, the table's very deceiving at the minute. You look at that match yesterday, right? Arsenal, what, second in the league? Joint on points with City? That was not 10th against second yesterday. We are a team that without any shadow of a doubt will be competing for Champions League football this season. Nothing is won and lost after eight games. We're a quarter way into the season now. I'm telling you now, come the end of the season, we are right in there when it comes to competing for those top five spaces. And do you know what? I'll be transparent here. If it wasn't five... Maybe I wouldn't be saying this, but because it's five and because I'm pretty sure this was a point you made to me every season gone by recently. What happens come the end of the season? No one fucking wants Champions League football. No one wants it, do they? Everyone starts losing that's in the race for Champions League football. And I just see the progression in us. I think we're definitely going to be right up there or thereabouts. Yeah, we dominated for 75 minutes against the title challenging team. And they had their best team other than one player with Jorginho. Mm. So like, you know, we when we were looking at that team sheet, as you say before the game, we were scared because that was their best team. And we were arguing that it wasn't necessarily our best team because of the players that we were missing out on. And so we were by far the underdogs and we've taken them right until the end of the game. They got they got two goals by two mistakes from us. Mm. It's as simple as that, right? We've switched off mainly because we're tired probably more than anything. And we've mixed it against one of, if not the best team in the league. So I think overall, the tactical setup, the performance, there's so much to be positive about. And that's why like, I'm not going to be negative about us at all yesterday. I thought it was a very, very good showing. I think, as you say there, like so much to be positive about. And when you look at the team's performance, literally like I'm so impressed now. I'm so impressed. And I, I said I said to Brian, we were talking after the match. I said, no matter what, right, whether we drop that lead or what, I'm so proud of the boys. Like I'm really, really proud of this team. And now like there was a, there was a certain time when I was looking at Chelsea and I was thinking, I get that, you know, we're hearing echoes in the media all the time. If this is a young squad, give them time. This is a team for the future. And obviously there was times when we were losing to the likes of Aston Villa and Nottingham Forest and dropping points against Bournemouth and I'm sort of sitting there thinking I don't know though I don't know whether I'm seeing enough I don't know whether we've spent all this money on these players and they're not gonna you know fulfill the potential we've got of them I'm sitting here now and I'm telling you mate give it 
two years, this team is going to be competing for titles. Like we look mustard. I think you're being moment. pessimistic. I think you're being really with the time frame. I think you're being really, really pessimistic there. I, I think we've got the building blocks to make a real difference this season and to be and to be right up there. Like I, I think it's almost too slow. Mm. Like we we've got so much to be positive about. And I understand why it feels like a loss to some people yesterday because of the position and how dominant we were in the game. But if you look at it, there is we, there are so many positivity. There's so much positivity around the club right now. Like the defense is solid. We haven't conceded a lot of goals. Fair enough. We got two yesterday. The midfield are looking elite. The the forward line are clicking. We've got players that cut that are coming back from injury. We've mixed it against one of the best teams in the league. Like there's there's so much to be out there and positive about. And remember, every single one of those players is going to get better. Like only Thiago Silva is going to drop out of that team next year. We're going to have that entire squad still there and, and at their best. Even Sterling, right? He's still mm. going to be in his prime then. So like we are going to get better. And that's why when we're comparing against other teams like United, for example, you go, they're, they're actually going to get worse. We're going to get better and better and better. And even like Arsenal have a young team as well, but like, are they at the, are they at their ceiling? Are they going to be able to push on and get better? I'm not sure. Whereas you look at us and you just go, there's so much room for improvement and, um, and positivity. And so I'm, I'm very bullish and I don't think, us Chelsea fans should be like dour and down about dropping the two points. I, I, uh, I really don't. Let's speak about individual performances yesterday. Obviously, yep. we are on a very positive note. So the first one that I want to get out of the way, Josh, talk to me about Sanchez. <sighs> it's so tough, isn't it? Because it's so easy to be really negative about him and then say he should be dropped and is he the goalkeeper that we need going forward? Do we need to sign in that position again? Well, just while you say that, just to quickly interrupt you, Petrovic, a lot of people um, around the player have been saying like Petrovic did not be brought in to be number two. He he genuinely believes he is a number one. He believes he's ready for first team football at the top level um, and he feels like he should be given an opportunity. Are you at the Blackburn match? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to be at the Blackburn match too. Would you like to see Petrovic given an opportunity in that Blackburn match, regardless of whether Sanchez had a had a good game, bad game, sank in between? Would you have liked to have seen him given a run out? I think it depends on what the coaching staff actually think of him. Because like because we don't know that much about him, we haven't seen him play a game for Chelsea at all. I don't know what his level is. And so I'm actually going to default to say, I want Poch to make that call because I don't know enough about him to make a, a, an informed decision. He could very well be a number one. And actually, look, a lot of goalkeepers that come in and as number twos fill their number ones and they end up just being very solid number twos. The key, the key thing for me is I haven't heard Pochettino talk about him at all. I haven't heard him mention his name in any interviews. Like uh, what Poch does very, very well is he goes, oh, so-and-so is training really well. They're going to come in the team. They look Did good. Did he with Brower, didn't he? Did Do you remember? With Brower, he went, someone yeah. was asking him about Jackson. He went, also well, remember Brower. Yeah, exactly. And he's done it with loads of other players as well. He does it all the time. Even Baddy Shield the other day, he said he's looked very good in training. He's coming back, really excited about him. And so to not hear a peep about Petrovic, I actually think that's more telling than anything mm. that we might not see him in the near future. So when we look at Sanchez, right, obviously, look, we're not going to sit here and just have blue tinted glasses on and go, oh, no, no, I couldn't have done it. Mate, listen, there's a there's a side of it, which I would sort of lie with you on when when we come to is that tactical instruction, yeah, to play out from the back. And I do actually think that there was a point yesterday before we conceded that goal when I did look at things and I thought, I actually want you to take the sting out of the game a little bit. And sometimes with the risks it comes with, I accept that. But playing out from the back can be one of the best ways to actually take the sting out of the game sometimes, especially when it's like getting like that and Arsenal are chasing. So I have a little bit of sympathy for him there. Obviously, it's not the first time we've seen him do it. You know, we were at that Brighton match in the cup. He did it a few times there. He's done it a couple of times now. Um, and it's something that needs to be erased out of his game very, very quickly. However, uh, yeah. I do genuinely think that when he first came in after about three games, I was thinking, mate, I don't know whether this fella's for us or not. And then the last six odd games, I've looked at him and I've been really, really impressed by Sanchez. Does he have a minor blip every now and again? Yeah, 
And does he need to eradicate that from his game? 100%, definitely. I, I want, you know, excellent performances week in, week out from all of our starting eleven. However, I do think, like, with goalkeepers, especially the way that modern-day football has gone, goalkeepers do need to be cut a little bit of slack. It's not Anana levels of mistakes, is it? And when you look at that, it's like Anana was brought to play out from the back, right? But he's making blunders. And even the goals that you wouldn't call a blunder, he should have done better for. Sanchez is making a lot of, in my opinion, match-winning or point-winning saves for us, isn't he? Yeah, he is. It's so dumb to get on his back and say um, that was a misplaced pass and he should be dropped. It's it's absolutely ludicrous in the way that modern football is played. We see players like Alisson Edison that are described as elite goalkeepers, some of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League era, make errors like that and they will do it three or four times a season, yeah. right? And to say and place the blame solely on Sanchez after a misplaced pass, which quite frankly, every other midfielder, defender does throughout the game, constantly, right? Yesterday's game. Yesterday's game, yeah. David Breyer, he's brilliant at playing out from the back, isn't he? Brought in because he's so good at playing out from the back. What happened? Misplaced the pass, Cole Palmer intercepts it. So, it, you know, it happens, and it happens even with the keepers that we look at and go, that's a brilliant ball-playing goalkeeper. You know that I was vocal about getting David Breyer in, but what I'm saying is I, I still rate David Breyer. Whether you're going on to the him and Ramsdale situation, that's a different story. But what I'm saying is even David Breyer, who is regarded very, very highly when it comes to being a keeper that can play out from the back showcase the mistake that he can make yesterday when Cole Palmer intercepted his lazy pass. So it happens, isn't it? Yeah, it does. I'm not, I'm not dropping him. And I see people like, uh, there's a lot of scores going around, isn't there? Uh, you know, of performances. And I saw one that Sanchez got like a 5.5 rating for the game. And actually like, he didn't have to do very much. He didn't really put a foot wrong other than that pass. And actually, I think you've also got to uh, put some blame towards Enzo, who misses mm. the pass. He's caught flat-footed. He's had to travel from South America. I understand why he was knackered. And actually, I think uh, Poch didn't make any changes in that midfield three. And I almost wish that he had. Mm. And it's actually, when you look at the the depth that we have, where you go, I understand why he didn't. But then you've got Uga Chukwu, who's it been brilliant. Mm. So bring one of those boys on. So uh, he has to take some of the blame. And then Gallagher, again, who was gassed at the end of the, the game and said that in an interview, he also didn't get back and make the challenge when he needed to either. So like, look, uh, I'm not saying that it's 100% Enzo's fault, 100% Gallagher's fault, or 100% Sanchez's fault. What I'm saying is it's probably 65% Sanchez and then a mixture between the two. And so, yeah, like he's made a mistake, but is it a fatal error? Is it an honor level error? It's nowhere near that. So like, I don't think we should be questioning him at all. And I totally agree with you that he's been immense for the past few games. And so I just think like we need to just move on, accept that they're going to be mistakes in the game and mm. just, just carry on from there. Conor Gallagher, a player that you mentioned there, we're going to get on to him because I would say for me, there was two standouts for man of the match. However, that's very harsh because we had so many players that did really well yesterday. But one player who's just going to fall ever so slightly short for me in terms of being a standout for man of the match, but one player that honestly like, <laughs> mate, this is the thing with covering football, isn't it? You get certain players, certain decisions that you'll speak out on. And once you've spoke on it, unless you're willing to go back through the archives and delete every comment you've said and every YouTube video you've done, people are going to be able to hold it against you. If someone was massively underperforming week in, week out, I believe that we have the right as fans, as, as match going fans as well, that really put our hand in our pocket to support our club. We have the right to be able to call them out on those performances. It's not a witch hunt, but we have the right to be able to talk about it. Even as early as, you know, uh, uh, as late, sorry, as this season, I was saying this man cannot play for Chelsea. There is something going on at Stamford Bridge. And that's not just Mauricio Pochettino's magic that he's working with the players, but it is the redemption arc <laughs> of Mark Kukurea. He's unreal, isn't he? It's, it was, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. To say that we were uh, ready to pack his bags and drive him out of the club, I think I think we were. I think it's we both nearly, said it's it. nearly Granite Xhaka levels it at is. Arsenal, throwing the armband off the pitch. And I feel bad saying that because Kuhl Correa has shown nothing but a good attitude the whole time he's been here. Mm. And, and as I say, like it is a little bit cringe when I look back on my past comments of what I've said about him and stuff like that. But the way this boy is playing, like, what has happened? What has actually happened? 
I don't understand it. I don't know what he's done. This is actually testament, I think, to Pochettino's man management and his individual coaching that he's got something out of him. Because let's be honest, he was done mm. as a player at the end of last season. And so Poch has obviously gone to him and gone, this is what I need you to do. Keep it simple. Keep it like, uh, just play it very, very easily and just do the easy things. Mm. And so I think Cucurello has come in and done that. I don't know what it is. I don't know what he's feeding him, mm. but it's obviously made a difference. You know, like uh, sometimes like with relationships, friendships, it's not so much about how long you've known that person. It's about what you've been through together. And because of what I feel that we've been through <laughs> with Cucurello in terms of the ups and downs, and let's be honest, most of them were fucking downs. Yeah. Because of that, he feels like a more senior player in our team, doesn't he? Like he don't feel like a boy that arrived at the start of last season like Kukurea feels like someone that's been about for ages now doesn't he yeah let's be honest when you look at the age profile as well he's one of he is one of our oldest states mm. statesmen and one of the most experienced players so yeah I don't I don't get it I think I'm looking at the stats now right he had um 80 percent accurate passes as well like it's just it's a, it's very very good for a player in uh, left back so I just think I don't know where it's come from mate but I'm so chuffed actually that he's come good because you get those players that their heads go down, they're out of the team, and then they just never recover. And I felt that Cucurella could have been one of those players that he ends up getting a move. He never performs at a level that he could have done and he never reaches his potential. And actually you look at it now, and I'm, I'm, I want to ask you this question. Who do you think are going to be our two left backs at the start of next season? Mate, this is a really, really hard one for me because, in fact, when you were asking me that question, I was sort of running through it in my head and I was thinking, right, Reese is going to be back. He's the captain. He's obviously, he's obviously going to be playing week in, week out. The only thing I would say about it is we've seen Pochettino go a bit rogue with positional changes before, and I would not disregard that possibly even happening with Reese James in terms of where on the pitch he plays. However, let's assume he's in at right back, yeah? Let's assume that Axel de Sassi and Thiago Silva are in the centre-back positions, and, you know, we've got Benoit Badia-Shile coming back. That's a potential one. We know he likes Levi Colwell at left back. I'm going to be really gutted to see... Kukurea get dropped because I do genuinely think that's probably what's going to happen but to answer your question in terms of who are our two left backs next season I do think that this is Thiago Silva's last season at the club for that reason the smart money would say that Levi Colwell comes back in at centre back and let's not forget he's played two um, two league matches at centre back this season three games if you include the Brighton game in the cup so it's not like he's only been at left back he has played a couple of matches at centre back as well. So you think that he comes back in there. Even if he's at left back, for some reason, we saw Man City link with him in the past. And this is not me saying I want him, I want him to go at all. He's a player that I love, but I could just maybe see this being Ben Chilwell's last season with the club. Wow. Uh, it, it, it's a big shout, isn't it? But I just, I just, I don't know. I don't know. That's not what I want, by the way. That's not what I want. I'm just saying the way the land lives, it is something that I could potentially see. Um, that was the that was the third choice that I that I was going to put. I thought that Ben Chilwell is nailed. I mm. thought Ben Chilwell will be there. Easy number one choice. Well, I don't I'm regard I, I don't regard Ian Matson as a left back really, and neither does Pochettino. So <laughs> I think he's more of an attacking player. Whether he's playing there for Burnley or not, different styles, different systems. I think he's more of an attacking player, Ian Matson. So it's very hard to answer that question Matson's for you. Gone. But do, do you think? that Ku Carrera is at the club next season? I think after the performances he's done recently, yes. And I think that Spanish connection with Pochettino, um, Spanish-speaking connection, makes a big difference. I think he has really, really improved him. And with the con the contract situation of Matson, whether we think he's a left-back or not, like he he, he sort of traditionally has played there. And I think that there's a, a very high likelihood now that Matson goes. If you, th if you think about it, it was a choice between Conor Gallagher or Matson previously. And uh, and Connor is going to stay, isn't yeah. he? And so I could just see Matson going. Well, we spoke about Connor Gallagher there. It would be an absolute outrage if we even entertained a sale of Connor Gallagher now. Connor Gallagher, for me, is Chelsea's most important player. And what I mean by that is not he's Chelsea's best player, not he's technically the most advanced. I mean, if you take one player out of that lineup now and you tell me, right, I can take one player out and it's going to cause the most damage by taking that man out. I'm telling you now, it's Conor Gallagher, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, 49 touches I've got here, 86 accurate passes and four key passes. Four key passes from a player who, let's be honest, like was a number 10, was pushing up being a number nine, was also all around the defence and the midfield. He was everywhere, as we know that Conor Gallagher does. And it's very interesting, actually, brief segue, in the uh, post-match 
press conference that he Conor Gallag- Gallagher did, he said that one of the key things that he um, has been asked for for Pochettino is to just run. He goes, I know that I'm very good at that. I know that I can get up and down the pitch. And I feel that that is the heartbeat of the team that we have right now. The ability for Connor to get in people's faces, press them. It makes other people better around him because they make mistakes. Then the ball falls to them and we get chances. So he is almost now and he's captain for a reason I don't know how you can drop him and I'm looking mate and I'm looking at how we set up the team going forward and you go on paper he should be the one that should actually be one of the ones that's questioned because you've got Cole Palmer that could play in that role you've got Nkunku coming back but for me I just don't know any universe any world in which he's dropped now I, because I, of that performance I honestly can't see it and not just because of that performance like the performances from the start of the season he has been electric Conor Gallagher and it's mad like do you know what I'm so in love with my team at the minute <laughs> like I uh, do you not <laughs> feel too. that way no, I totally agree I totally agree I absolutely love it like even in years gone by when we were winning major silverware I can't say that we always played like beautiful football and sometimes it was a little bit more rough and ready but I didn't care whatever worked for us the way we play and the uh, it's mad to have been able to have an overhaul like this but feel such a connection to this team like would you agree with that? We feel a real connection here, don't we? Yeah, totally. Like, it's it's beautiful. And, like, to have Academy boys still in the team when we have had so much upheaval is immense. And it makes a big difference for me. And I mean this intentionally. Connor is the heart of that team right now. And that's why we need to hold on to some of these Academy players. And this is a plea. Please, Todd Bowley. Do not sell all of these academy boys because if we do, we're going to lose that sort of like that heart and that spirit, regardless of how good every single one of the other acquisitions has been. And you're totally right. They have been amazing. But we need that sort of like that Chelsea DNA. You see it with Colwell and how calm he is on the ball. You see it when Reese James comes on and he is... Uh, you know, the best right back in Europe, a lot of uh, fan bases would say, not just us with our biased blue glasses on. A lot of people would say that. So I feel that we, if we have that core and then we get a set of young players around them that are hungry and build relationships with us, like we we see that now, like Mudrick is building a relationship with the fans. We all want him to succeed. Cole Palmer is so cool and calm on the ball. We're seeing how silky he is. We, he is. Like we love that as Chelsea fans, don't we? So like you're totally right we are building a real real affinity here and this is the thing for me when I came out of the game yesterday if that was at the end of last season I would have been so down even even if it was a, just a draw against Arsenal I would have been down because it would have been part of a an overall malaise of our football club whereas now it's like this is so positive and there's so much to look forward to you're like you can't help but be excited so I'm I'm chuffed mate the good news with your plea to Todd Bowley <laughs> is Todd Bowley is a long-term subscriber of the channel. <laughs> He's a big fan of the channel, big watcher. Um, the last man, I'm going to quickly rattle through this. He won the man of the match. For me, he's had a shout at being man of the match for every single match that he's played recently. He is electric. He's ice cold. We were having a good laugh on the kickoff yesterday because we were saying before uh, ball was kicked, you know, we were saying about how Arsenal have match winners and, and Brian was maybe saying there's not really a Chelsea player. And I went, uh, Cole Palmer. And he started laughing at me. He went, are you seriously? hanging your hat on Cole Palmer. I said, yeah. I said, Cole Palmer's the bollocks, mate. I said, Cole Palmer is the daddy. Like, what are we going on about here? Cole Palmer is electric. And he showed that yesterday. I've got a little quote here. In his post-match interview, he said, I tried to show the manager every day in training what I can do. Work hard, try and repay him because he puts a lot of faith in me. I'm loving it at Chelsea. Every day is a, is good. Even off the pitch with the lad, there's such a good vibe. There's still a lot of areas we can improve on. As I say, we went toe-to-toe with Arsenal. We're going in the right direction. There's more to come. Now, that was music to my ears, and particularly when he's talking about the atmosphere. Because one thing that, obviously, a man we we have a very, very soft spot for, Frank Lampard, spoke about the atmosphere not being maybe great last season. And obviously, when I, like, oh, it's a bit cringe almost, I watch all the training footage. Like, I watch <laughs> everything that Chelsea put up on the YouTube channel. I watch all the training footage and I'm always looking for body language. I'm always looking to see, like, what players are looking like and who gets on. And you often see, like, the players mixing a lot more than, than maybe you have in uh, seasons gone by and whatnot. Um, and there looks like there's a good atmosphere. But I understand that, 
you know, there's ways to edit everything and put a positive spin on everything. So I'm always very, very interested when I hear that sort of thing coming out of the players. So that's a, that's a box tick for me and it's got to be credit to Mauricio Pochettino. But just on Cole Palmer... We've got him at a snip at 40 million, haven't we? People are saying, how have Manchester City let this boy go? But their loss is our gain. And like you were saying about Conor Gallagher, I believe that's a man we can build a team around. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really surprised about how good Cole Palmer's actually that been for us. Like, I think I saw him at Man City and I thought, that's a very promising young player. We didn't see him play that much, but when he played, he actually did come on and he was involved in goals. Like, we saw it in the Community Shields. Like, even, even in that game, he was, he was brilliant. But I didn't know whether he had the uh, ability to go and play week in, week out in the Premier League. And I actually thought when we were signing him, I don't know what you thought. I thought when we signed him, I wasn't sure whether he was going to be Chelsea quality. Mm. And I feel that he's proven every single one of us wrong. And you were right when you were saying that stuff before the kickoff. He is one of the players that is our talismanic player now. Brian's words, true Geordie, <laughs> his words were, Joey's got a massive hard-on for Cole Palmer. Is he right? I mean, you do love Cole Palmer. You do love him. But the hard-on is... Was it is, yeah, 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 yeah. But the hard-on is, is warranted. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's warranted yeah, hard-on. Yeah. yeah. But look, look, look. Let me just tell you this, right? He got 0. 0.95 expected goals. So that was our... In terms of our individual players, that was our most um, goal contribution player. He obviously got his goal. He got 0. 0.13 expected assists, which again was our most in our entire team. He had 96% accurate passes and one key pass as well and 35 touches. Overall, if you're looking at performances, especially against a team like Arsenal, statistically, that is elite. So, like, all of the things he's passing, eye tests, yes, ability to improve, yes, stats in each game, yes, you know, comes on, scores a penalty, high pressure game. Like, there's there's a tick box, yes, 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 yes. Now, before we go, I will say this one thing about Cole Palmer though, mate. He should have scored and we should have got 3-0. We should have been 3-0 up. Mm. And it like, I know that you disagree and you thought that was a good save from Ryder, do you not? Yeah, I, look, it's not that I disagree saying he should have scored. Yes, you'd like him to score, but I don't think it's a tragedy that he didn't score. What I would say is sometimes to get yourself into these opportunities, you have to make those opportunities. I think that, oh, I don't want to, it sounds like I'm being negative here, but I am going to speak my mind here. I think if it was down to maybe Raheem Sterling to be able to take that ball down and control it with the sort of misplaced pass from David Raya, I think that there's a good chance that he doesn't manage to control that ball and get the opportunity himself. Because it wasn't like the one where it just got past Declan Rice. Like there was pace on the ball from Raya and obviously uh, Cole Palmer's took it down and, and good first touch to get in that position. Once he's there, he should score. What I would say is if I'm David Raya, I'm very happy with my contribution in terms of being able to rectify my mistake there because I thought the keeper did well for it. Yeah, he did. But I feel when you're one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper in that scenario, you should be scoring more often than not. Mm. And, and on your point on Raheem Sterling, Raheem Sterling would have been in the position to make the block so he wouldn't have been there I don't think Mudrick would have been in the position to make the block so it shows that Cole's technical ability to read the game and to know that Rye will be wanting to make that pass into the sort of the six the pivot role like that that shows his footballing intelligence so credit where credit's due fair enough he's in the position but for me he was weak with that shot and well, he didn't even get a shot away, mm. did he? So that's why it, that's why it's weak. So, like, I, I'm by no means saying that therefore he shouldn't be man of the match. He absolutely should have been, and his overall performance, as we say, was it was it elite. And I'm not going to use that word uh, lightly. It was elite, but he should be slotting that. And if we are three 0 up in that position, we we probably go and win the game. We probably win the game three 0 mm. We probably don't concede because then it's a lot easier to to drop in and and they won't be pushing as far forward. So I thought I thought that was a shame, but overall uh, an immense performance. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal yesterday. I'm not saying we're going to win the league, <laughs> but I'm sort of saying that. Um, now nah, listen, really really good stuff. I'm absolutely buzzing for Saturday's match against Brentford. It's a match that both of us are going to be in attendance for. You lot need to keep your eyes peeled because within the next couple of days, we will be dropping the pre-match preview where we'll be talking Chelsea, talking Brentford. Josh will be giving his starting 11 for that match. And obviously, I'll give my final thoughts video later on in the week where I'll give my starting 11 for the match. But please do me a massive favour. We've ran massively over here. And you know what? We probably could have done another half hour talking about this game. So we're trying to keep it as short and sweet 
sweet as a 45 odd minute video can be. But do me a massive favor to say thank you for Josh, who, who let's be honest, would have liked to lie in this morning, <laughs> wouldn't you, Josh? Would've he would have liked to lie, liked to especially lie on a Sunday morning. We were at the kickoff pretty <laughs> late last night. So to show your appreciation, click the link in the description to this video. Subscribe to Josh's channel, which obviously is producing loads of good content. He's banging out Chelsea content on a weekly basis. And if you're not already, make sure you are subscribed to this channel. We just hit 60K and things are going up so quick that I'm not even speaking about these things now. It's crazy, isn't it? So from the bottom of my heart, very, very grateful because none of these opportunities I'll be getting will be happening without you lot. So I'm very appreciative. Subscribe, click the bell. I will see you all in the next one.